This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. Mayday, mayday. Going down. You take your red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole is. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. I see Welcome back. As you can see, we have uh, Stephen Hawking on the podcast. <laughs> couple yes, drinks. Yes, we do. Couple <laughs> drinks. Uh, welcome, welcome. If you're a first time listener and you're wondering what you've stumbled across, we are the Swerve Podcast, and we are three random guys on a mission to understand everything in the universe, one obscure topic at a time. So our premise is pretty fucking basic every week we pick a topic we don't know anything about we research it and then discuss it on the fly here on the podcast so that's that's what we're all about i mean this week's topic is a good one we're gonna do it a little different we're doing poltergeists but instead of doing focusing on one topic within poltergeists we've each picked a couple topics a couple different poltergeists and we're going to alternate discussing them then presenting them and we'll uh we'll see how this goes it's a little bit different from our other our other form the format we've been doing so far but uh envy do you have anything to say about yes anything? for our value listeners you can support us on patreon through patreon we have two exclusive tiers we have ride the wave tier which is our one dollar tier it gets you exclusive never for her content and it will get you numerous shout outs on the sort podcast then hey, we have our t- our three dollar tier. This is our slap that ass tier. Thus far, every person who subscribed has subscribed to this. Tier. Yes, it is. With this, you will also get exclusive never heard content. You will get numerous shots on the sort of podcast, but most importantly, you will get early access to all of our all of our main episodes and our post swerves. This is all on Sundays, three days and five days prior to their releases. So, hell, you will have the load on the scoop, the info on all your friends and family. Be on the lookout. Fuck yeah. 100%. We love all the support. Um, Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Let's do it. I guess it's a great time to mention our secondary component yeah. to this podcast. Yeah. That's why it's a good time. Me crack a beer. Yeah. We did. Dragon, that's tell them about our secondary good. component. That's, that was a, that's, what, that's what I was trying to accomplish. Fucking nice. Okay. Yeah. Um. We like to dabble in the booth. Some of us have been dabbling for a little longer today <laughs> than others. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm feeling a little dangerous right now. But yeah, we like to drink while we do this. We like to loosen up the conversation. Just get the creative juices flowing. So And, and experiment with different booths, different types of drinks. Um, we are still in pandemic protocols unfortunately so we are meeting via uh zoom or whatever we're using now um (laughs) i don't know if we're doing something and it's not important um so it's a little harder to experiment with different like share different types of booze craft beers cocktails or whatever so we're kind of just all doing our own thing um so i'll start us off the round table i have been doing shots of fireball cinnamon whiskey <laughs> since the morning <laughs> since, yeah fuck it why not it's five o'clock it's five o'clock somewhere right and then uh chasing it down with a budweiser so keeping, <laughs> I, keeping her real classy today on the uh, swerve tis the season if you will although this won't be released until way after the season <laughs> well it was recorded when i was on vacation so fuck them <laughs> so fuck them. So I have, uh, I started busting out. It's just, you know, just a little something sweet, little something, you know, just to mix it up a little bit. 
Got some raspberry you sour puss. pussy. Fuck He's yeah. drinking sour puss. Fuck yeah. Here we go. So a little bit of that, but then also the classic. Diving into the girlfriend's Corona. stash, eh? It's actually my stash. <laughs> so I, I have a. Uh, I remember when I was oh. 15 and my mom put sour push shot, uh, like little airplane sour push things in our stockings. Yeah. And uh, fuck, man. Come on. You're better. That's my point. That was 15 year old. <laughs> that was a 15 year old so, dragon. I have on deck at any given time I can make sour jacks. So that's hence why I have. Um, I actually have a two six of this as well. This is just my little Mickey. Might I ask, where's the Jack but, Daniels then? Oh, it's yeah, in the fridge. That could be well, our should make a sour shot jack this week. Sour jack. No, I'm not yeah, making sour jacks on the pod. Well, I you actually, make a you know fucking what? sour jack right now. Just switch around your have, mouth. Uh, so I got Burt Reynolds on deck, so I have um, I have like butter ripple schnapps and hard alcohol to make that. Like I can you're make doing mojitos it on the pod, at any given time. Have... No, it's like yeah, literally I keep it all in my fridge ready to go. Well, when, you, when you say it's on deck, that means like you're about to have it next to drink. Okay, well, no. I think you should make a Sour Jack. That could be our featured shot this week. It could be. That would be some, that would be wise. And you should take a picture of it and, and upload send it. it to me. Yeah, okay. Please. Okay. Jagger bombs. Yeah, 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 you actually do have a pretty sweet little bar at all times. Yeah. Every time I, you know, post or pre-pandemic after party at Magnum's house was always interesting shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this fucking dick would wait till everyone's super hammered at the end of the night. Like everyone's about to leave. There's 15 minutes left. And he whips out a 2-6 of Jägermeister. And he's like, hot potato. And I, yeah, yeah it usually gets done. It's it gets everyone way oh, more. Oh, it's a tradition. It's a tradition. I actually don't think he's a dick for that. I respect him for that. <laughs> <laughs> the last fifteen minutes, it's like everyone's about to leave. No, it's not. It it's never the last fifteen up. minutes. I. It's always at midnight. When midnight hits, and We're if I'm now. at a party, that's the last so call for us. <laughs> we are hot potatoing at two six. <laughs> Uh, that's I funny. still I drink later in the night now. It's crazy. Like I I've always been a long distance drinker. Like I don't stop. Like once the train is rolling, I'm going. But once I'm it pretty hits my good. mouth. I can't stop. Like, honestly, man, like honestly, like three beers. It's like okay, let's let's rock and roll. Frank the to tank. Frank the tank. That's it. <laughs> like, yeah. I uh. <laughs> Well, I, We're going I drink... streaking. We're going streaking. <laughs> I like to party. What can I say? Let's just do it. But uh, I like like going like the shots. I'm better at pacing myself now. Like I know, like you get older, right? So you know the your body's cues is like okay, it's time to take. It's time to start mixing a water every drink or whatever. But yeah, I'll drink right. till six, six, seven in the morning. No My limit now. is eleven drinks. That could be shots. <laughs> that can be beers. What? It can be a mixture. But eleven after eleven, I get fucked. Like I'm, I'm throwing up after eleven. What? That's a warm up, dog. Hmm. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm weak Dude. when it comes to alcohol. Interesting. I probably had eleven drinks right now. Yeah, uh, fucking Magnum's like, yes. Now I know you're gonna get fucked up next camping trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe we should hop into the basics here because we've been uh, rambling a little bit. Let's fucking talk about some poltergeist. So I want to, like I said, we're switching this up a little bit. We each have a couple topics we've independently researched. So I don't know what Dragon's going to talk about. I don't know what Envy's going to talk about, and they don't know what I'm going to talk about. And we're going to attempt to figure out poltergeist based on the case studies we each looked at. But to get it started, um, we need to hop into the basics because we need to understand a little bit about what poltergeists are. And I did learn some interesting things uh, that I didn't know before. So basically, poltergeist refers to a particular type of paranormal event. These events, they usually have a feeling of potential mayhem associated with them. So there's kind of like, you never really know what's going to happen. It's kind of like, uh, what did you say? You're like on an edge and or at a climax or something. And at any given time, something crazy could happen, but you don't know when exactly. It's mm -hmm. almost there's like a degree of anarchy associated with it um, in the sense that 
the what occurs doesn't always have to be the same thing. It can differ. So you don't really know what's going to happen. It's like the poltergeist. It's like fucking with you in different ways. And it, it might it, there's fuck like a, you. It might hurt you. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> it might fuck you. Yeah. And at any moment, something could turn to violence it, and like really fast. You know, it could just you could have something as simple as knocks. You're just hearing knocks. And then all of a sudden you have fires being started. Like it can be crazy shit happening. So um, as far as typical events that are associated with poltergeists, uh, a lot of the times there's physical disturbances, and this includes the movement of physical objects, which I'm sure will come up in our case studies, uh, the destruction of items, uh, a lot of electrical disturbances, for instance, um, lights turning on and off, or different things turning on suddenly, or not functioning the way they should be. But there's also like a, um, a mischief associated with it almost like the poltergeist is attacking a certain person um people can feel sensations of being pinched bit um, or just in general roughhoused or sometimes they can be tripped or pushed there's there's these types of things as well so those are kind of like general features at least that i was seeing that were reported in case studies and seem to be reported by people the other thing that's kind of interesting, the term poltergeist, it's a German term, and this German term was adopted into our English-speaking language, and it roughly translates to noisy ghost. <laughs> so, and that's interesting because in my research, I did find that poltergeists although they stand for noisy ghost, they're often completely different than what you would consider a classic ghost. So it's not necessarily a ghost that's causing the poltergeist. The poltergeist is its own thing. So there's a distinction that, I don't know, paranormal researchers or investigators make. A poltergeist is not necessarily a ghost. And I think that might be important. But I don't know, maybe... Be can be but usually a it's usually, is usually more malevolent that's right so like yeah the ghosts are more um you know it's like an apparition that you're you're seeing like a physical person or something not often do you see the physical entity with the poltergeist although you can so there's there's that difference too and then often ghosts are associated with a repetition of a similar pattern of behavior where poltergeists are not like that. They're completely, like we were just saying, there's like a degree of anarchy, chaos, different things like this. And this kind of goes into our uh, first episode, Stone Tape Theory, like this ghosts have a typical pattern of behavior. It's almost like, uh, like with Stone Tape Theory, when we were talking about that, that's that basically means that there's some kind of impression or a memory or an essence of some traumatic event or a person embedded into physical reality so for instance it could be in a staircase and then you see a ghost going up and down the staircase just the same way you would see a tape recording play it, it, stone tape theory is saying that the ghost the reason it has the same pattern of behavior is because it's it's literally recorded it's just a recording whereas poltergeists don't have that feature at all like it's completely it's like they know what they're doing does that make sense i don't know Yes. The difference between a poltergeist and a ghost? Yes. Okay, cool. It's like a paranormal thing. I don't know. It like is. That's, well, that's, yeah, they're, they're is both that paranormal experiences. One's more malevolent or like evil-like, which is the poltergeist. A ghost could just be an apparition that appears but doesn't necessarily try and harm you. Correct. So usually the poltergeist, they're associated with great emotional trauma so this can be like a broken romance, a tragic accident, or a sudden death. These are typically features that precede these types of visitations. Um, but one thing that's important to note, poltergeists, they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So the time between those different points can vary completely. Like It can be years between a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
there is an end. <laughs> and when it ends, it's usually done and it's finished and it doesn't repeat again. Um, whereas like with the ghosts and things like this, those are kind of like a constant thing. They kind of never stop unless there's some kind of cleansing or, you know, like shit like this. So those are some other distinctions that I think um, are somewhat important. The other thing too is the poltergeist, it, it can occur. It's, it's different than a ghost in another way because it can be associated with buildings. So you, it can be in a home, a pub, a hospital. It can be associated with places. So it could be like a street, you know, a footpath or an alley. It can also be physical items. Um, but the thing, the poltergeist that is somewhat different than the ghost, it can also be associated with a person. So the person can go to a completely different location and they could still have the poltergeist fucking with them, things like this. And that seemed to be something else that was different. Um, so that's about it I have for the basics to just define and kind of make sense of what the fuck we're talking about. Very like nice. really for me, I think none of that was a surprise to me except the distinction between a poltergeist and a ghost type deal because I guess they are quite different. So it should have been yeah. called pol poltergeist busters, not ghost busters, basically. Oh, hot take. Interesting. Hot take. They fucked Great up. Three years first on the Swerve podcast. Wouldn't be the first time Hollywood fucked up Fuck Harvey Weinstein. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So we go are right. we going to dive into some stories here? Yeah, let's hop yeah. into some of the. Let's hop in, Dragon. You're gonna start us off with a case okay, study yeah. you found. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to start us off with the Bell Witch of Tennessee. Bell, Bell Witch of Tennessee. 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 I've also been to Tennessee. If you ever want to go there to Nashville to party, awesome spot to go. But anyway, also, NASCAR. also awesome pickup line. It's like, are you from Tennessee? Uh, like, no. You're the only ten I see. Whoa, hey -oh. Spitting game for all the listeners out there. Try that one. 100%. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you will get a well, reaction. You will get a reaction. <laughs> You're gu <laughs> You'll guarantee to get laid. I mean. No. Well, you will guarantee to get a reaction. Get a reaction. <laughs> probably not laid. Okay, so the Bell Witch, or the, well, the Bell Witch Haunting. It's a legend from the southern United States. Um, so it's from the Robertson County in Tennessee. So it's uh, based off Farmer John Bell Sr. He Farmer, what a fucking classic name for a farm. Farmer John, like. Farmer John, that's right. That's like biblical, ain't it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so he resided with his family along the Red River in an area currently near the town of Adams. Which mm, There's a lot of biblical shit there. <laughs> Is that where the Adams family's from? Oh, man, I didn't get into that. <laughs> I don't know. No, probably not. But it's just <laughs> we're talking about creepy things and they're kind of creepy. Uh -huh. Um. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so... According to legend, from 1817 to 1821, his family and the local area came under attack by a mostly invisible entity that was able to speak, affect the physical environment, and shapeshift. Uh, some, some accounts record the spirit also to have been a clear... I'm going to butcher some of these words, so because I've been drinking a little bit, but a, 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 little bit. a clairvoyant... Yeah, clairvoyant. Clairvoyant, which... So it, it could, like, see the future and, like, predict stuff. Okay, yeah, thank you. And capable of crossing long distances with superhuman speed. Um, except it and, wasn't a human. Well, except it wasn't a human, yeah. But that's what it says. So they can <laughs> move quickly. I don't know. I don't know how big the county is, but it, I guess it haunted a few people. Um. In 1894, newspaper editor Martin V. Ingram published his Authenticated History of the Bell Witch, 
Uh, the book is widely regarded as the full length re record of the legend and primary source of subsequent treatments. Yeah. I think the one thing that I find interesting about a lot of these case studies, I like this came up with mine too, is it always seems to be someone makes a book about things. And to me, that's a huge conflict of interest. I don't know how you get around it, right? But like if someone is investigating the the topic and they stand to gain financially from it by, you know, publishing and making money on the sales of a book, it's in, it's hard. Like how can, how much can you trust the document? And maybe that's a question we'll have at the end, but you know what well, I'm saying? Yeah, like it's it kind of, it's, yeah, no, you are right. It, it, it does come down. Yeah. It's always skeptical. So yeah. in his book, he published the poltergeist name was Kate um, after the entity claimed at one point to be the old Kate bats, which I don't okay. know. Um, and continue to respond favorably to the name. Uh, the physical activity centered on the bell's youngest daughter, Betsy and her father and Kate expressed particular displeasure when Betsy became engaged to a local named Joshua Gardner. So Kate, so, Kate's the like the entity, right? Kate, Kate is the poltergeist, and then so she didn't like that the youngest daughter Betsy got engaged to this Joshua Gardner guy, and because she's jealous, she wants like the, she probably wants to fuck that guy. Maybe <laughs> very. Possible. I don't know. So I'm, the I'm spouting theories out. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Well, keep spouting them. I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it. I think she uh, wants to fuck that guy, but she can't because she's a fucking ghost poltergeist. <laughs> well, hey, have you seen what, what scary movie was that where the one chick scary movie two scary movie two gets railed by the ghost? It's possible. Yeah. So it's the possible. haunting began sometime in 1817 when John Bell witnessed the apparition of a strange creature resembling a dog. Bell fired at the animal, but it so she was fucking a dog. <laughs> Well, she's clearly not doing her chores. She's just fucking the dog, screwing the pooch. <laughs> um, so Bear, Bell fired at the animal, but it disappeared. John's son, Drew, Bell approached an unknown bird perched on the fence that flew off and was of extraordinary size. Uh, the, daughty, the, 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 daughty, the daughter, Betsy, observed a girl in a green dress swinging from the limb of an oak tree. So these are all the sightings. So Dean, a person enslaved by the Bell family, reported being followed by a large black dog on evenings he visited his wife. Activity moved to the Bell household with knocking heard along the doors and walls. The family heard sounds of gnawing on the beds, invisible dog fighting, um, and chains along the floor. So around this time, John Bell began experiencing paralysis in his mouth. Um, the phenomena grew in intensity as sheets were pulled from the beds of the ch as the children slept. Soon, the entity pulled hair and scratched the children with particular emphasis on Betsy, who was slapped, pinched, and stuck with pins. She's the one that uh, was like She's, dating some guy or something that was making yeah, so jealous. Yeah, so she was. Yeah, so she was dating Joshua Gardner or engaged to Joshua Gardner. And for some reason, the spirit didn't like that. Because he wanted it for himself. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it seems like a lot of the sightings are associated with, like, a dog, which is weird. I don't know why that well, would be the case. I just think that's just probably they dogs were pretty prevalent on a farm. So they just heard a lot of, like, dog fighting. Like, they're hearing things. They're, these kids are being... Oh, man. It's definitely, like... Like paranormal activity, like the beds being pulled off the sheet. Yep. Remember that movie? Oh my goodness, that spooked me yep. out. That was a good um, one. That was a good fucking movie. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if it was good. It's made me fucking. I didn't like that movie. <laughs> I'm not a big scary movie guy though. So. Um, okay, so the bells turn to a family friend, James Johns Johnston, for help. Uh, so after retiring for the evening at the Bell home. Johnson was awakened the night by the same phenomena 
That morning, he told John Bell it was a spirit, just like in the Bible. Of course, go figure. So soon, word of the haunting spread with some traveling great distances to see the witch. Uh, the apparition began to speak out loud. The <laughs> spirit starts talking. People are traveling to come see the spirit. Um, sorry to everyone who is like an expert of this topic while I just butcher it. Um, <laughs> so it was asked, like, who are you? What do you want? And the voice answered, I am a spirit. I was once very happy, but I have been disturbed. The spirit offered diverse explanations of why it had appeared, um, tying its origins to the disturbance of a Native American burial ground located on the property, and sent Drew Bell and Bennett Porter on an unproductive search. So, yeah, so then these guys went on a search for buried treasure, of course, because they're like, oh, the spirit says it's on a burial ground. We better... uh, (laughs) <laughs> so they're looking for fucking some yeah, spoils so yeah so now they're just like well we're on a burial ground something obviously is buried here of importance um so with the emergence of full still, conversation still stealing the fucking native american shit no even kidding, after okay. death even after the, death yeah it's fucked up the white man <laughs> can't get enough um excuse me so with the emergence of full conversations the spirit repeated Word for word, two sermons given 13 miles apart at the same time. So, like, that just relates to the how it could travel the distances. Like, it was haunting a, a large amount of ground. Like, okay. Like, simultaneously, so, basically, yeah, almost, so like or something. A, yeah, so, like, on a day of worship, it, it was word for word repeating sermons given 13 miles apart. Which, hmm. in this time, traveling 13 miles, I'm guessing, was... A big deal. <laughs> I wonder what it sounded like. like yeah, I'm what, curious. I'd be curious. To <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, is it like scary or is it kind of like I don't know? Like you know, like what does it sound like? Does it have an accent or does it, it have like, like Cartman? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, it's sure like, it had some, I'm sure it had some sort yeah, of southern draw. Take your blankets, fucking bitch. <laughs> but yeah, it's so my this man. End- <laughs> this entity was well acquainted with biblical text and appeared to enjoy religious arguments. What? As, so I just, I was like... But I thought it was Native American. Like, why would it give a fuck? Well, maybe it's just been around for Christianity. a while. Been, I don't know. It just seemed to... Well, maybe that's what it was arguing about. Maybe. Like, like your your god is fake. The spirit buffalo is the real... Yeah, spirit, like... <laughs> or, or something, you know what I mean? So, Could as be. other amusement, the witch shared gossip about activities in other households, so I'd like to stir the pot. And at times appeared to leave for brief moments to visit homes after inquiry. So, like, after it would hear some gossip, it would apparent, it would go and it would go to another home and, and try and stir shit up or find out if it was true, apparently. Hmm. Okay. So John Johnst- Johnston, the son of James, devised a, tet- a test for the witch, something no one, out- no one outside of his family would know. So asking the entity what his Dutch step-grandmother in North Carolina would say to the slaves if she thought they would, if they did something wrong, the witch replied with his grandmother's accent, which I'm kind of making do up it here, so it do tut, it tut. what has happened now that's all i got that's the best i can do <laughs> so, that's what she would say <laughs> that's it i guess so that's that's what it's what was here. it hot tut hot tut what has happened now <laughs> that's so basic <laughs> it's kind of yeah, yeah it seems easily replicable so in another account an englishman stopped to visit and offered to investigate on remarking on his family overseas, the witch suddenly began to mimic his English parents. Again, at early morning, the witch woke him to voices of his parents, worried as they had heard his voice as well. The Englishman quickly left that morning and later wrote the Bell family that the entity had visited his family in England. He apologized for his skepticism. So, this so Englishman, it's all over the fucking place. Yeah, so this Englishman... 
traveled to come and see this witch and was like, you know, asking questions or whatever. And then it traveled to England, met his family, and started mimicking them. Took an Uber. Took an Uber. It's expensive Uber. Um, Damn. So at times, the spirit displayed a form of kindness, especially towards Lucy, John Bell's wife. Uh, the most perfect woman to walk to earth, the spirit would say. The witch would give Lucy fresh fruit. The and most sing perfect Lisa. women to walk the earth. I, I think this uh, this witch is a lesbian, <laughs> or just maybe just a horn dog. Maybe I don't she know. She got mad when the when the chick was about to marry a dude. She's like, "No, this isn't happening." She's very fond of the wife, and she only seems to communicate with the females the most. Like she seems to take care of them almost. She's a yeah, lesbian. She's, she's a lesbian. She's a lesbian. No, we got to the bottom of that. <laughs> so this witch also claimed to, or showed intentions to kill John Bell. So she referred to him as see. Old, there you go. Lesbian. Old, old Jack. <laughs> a feminist lesbian. <laughs> So she si- and signaled this intention to those to fucking kill feminists. They fucking through... even after the grave, they're still going for it. <laughs> like, you just can't win, I guess. Eh? You just can't um, win. <laughs> so she showed her intentions with this through curses, threats, and aff- afflictions. Um. So the story climaxes with the bell patriarch being poisoned by the witch so so that it it poisoned her. this this uh so she kills the man guys poisons John cuts bell. his dick off and buries it and they found it as treasure later so after and that's all how the first this, dildo was created <laughs> and that's how the first dildo was created very nice so after yes. all this in 1821, as a result <laughs> of the witch's uh, in treatment, Betsy, the daughter, calls off her engagement to Joshua Gardner. Um, subsequently, I'm the s- entity, entity... I'm sorry to the- disrupt, but did they have dildos at this time? Or did they I'm just, sure like, they, if... I'm sure they had Did they just have to use, like, form. that broomstick handles and shit like vegetables. this? Vegetables. Let's use vegetables. Just, like, a super <laughs> polished piece of wood. I'm genuinely asking, like, what... It probably there wasn't must have as been. advanced. I'm sure there was something. But they was also it just like, cucumbers and carrots. But wouldn't at this point masturbation be a sin? So like, probably maybe not. Yeah, it's a sin, but like people were doing it. True. True. I don't know. Google it. I well, let's just say it's broomsticks and vegetables. That's fine. Polished polished broomsticks. Um but, 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 uh, I lost my train of thought again. Way they got go, divorced man. or called the engagement off or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she breaks up with Joshua Gardner. Um, subsequently, the entity told the family it was going to leave, but return in seven years, in 1828. Uh, the witch returned on time to Lucy and her sons, Richard and Joel, with similar activities as before, but they chose not to encourage it, and the witch appeared to leave again. Um, several accounts say that during the military career, Andrew Jackson was intrigued with the story of his men, but his men were frightened away after traveling to investigate. So people, yeah, so like wartime or whatever, people were coming to check this out. They were like, the men were like frightened, like, so like it spread, like the rumor of this place spread. Yes, pretty much. That's the main story behind it. Is so she was like, uh. A... It was just like some bitch, jealous about some stuff, fucking around, poking people, taking blankets, shit like this. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean that's that makes sense. So that's that's the that's a brief butcher bell witch talk of the bell witch of Tennessee. All right, Fuck I yeah. guess I'll take over now. Yeah, let's hear it. What did you? What's your topic? I will be covering the Brolay Rectory. Burley Rectory. The Broley Re- Rectory. Rectory. This is the most haunted house in England, as described by psychic researcher Harry Price. Okay. It was constructed in 1862. The house 
was of Gothic architecture and believed to be haunted since its development, just because it was Gothic. Okay. So this house would house the leader of the parish, and the parish is kind of like a following of Christians in a village. So it's like an entire village of Christians. Um, the rector is the leader of that parish, and in this case, um, it, it would be most similar to a cleric. Uh, the village was located in northern Essex in England. So paranormal talk and haunting claims were there from from its conceptualization in 1862, but they started to see more and more events occur, and in terms of the hauntings, they seem to see a peak in 1929 when Harry Price, who is the paranormal researcher, published in the Daily Mirror and wrote some books. So, hell, he had something to gain out of this. Yeah. Yeah. So, the Society for Psychical Research, uh, this is a society that existed within the time in England, did a study and con- conclu- concluded that most of the sightings to be imagined or fabricated, and this cast doubt on Price. So neither to expose nor report the change, the public perception, in fact, it only garnered more attention. So this discrediting of Mr. Price did nothing to dissuade the public from believing in ghosts. In fact, So what year is this happening? So in 1862 was a conceptualization, and in the 1900s is when these events started to occur. So the cool thing about this, it spans over several, several generations. Oh, so the poltergeist yeah. is like fucking around for a long time. Very long time, yeah. So that goes into like when we were saying there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's yeah. So that's the beginning a huge essentially middle. is 1862. The middle would be like kind of the peak around 1930s, and then the end would be late 1900s, essentially. But wow, yeah. So BBC wanted to do a broadcast of the hauntings here, so they want to send out their own reporters, and this was set to take off in 1956. However, it was cancelled because the previous widow of the last rector to reside in the house who had died there warned and threatened to sue the BBC if they ended up doing an expose on this house and the hauntings there. Okay. So, a little bit of precursor history, sort of why people think the house itself was haunted. It is believed that there's a legend of Benedictine Monastery where a monk had a relationship with a nun from a nearby covenant. They were discovered, and the monk was executed, and the nun was bricked up alive in the covenant walls. Oh, so there's a dead nun in the walls? So not in the house. Allegedly. But in the the covenant right next to the house, yes, there was supposed to be a corpse of a nun who was bricked up alive. So this legend... what a way to go. This legend was investigated. However, there was not... There was no truth discovered to support the evidence, but locals attribute the hauntings to the start of this legend. So I guess yeah, the we'll other thing the too, like, now. why would you fucking put a dead body in your walls? Like your home would reek. I don't know. Some she was bricked up tribute? alive within the covenant, though supposedly, and the monk was yeah, executed. Yeah, it just seems like it seems like such a terrible idea. I don't know. Like, can't you People... just fucking cap them like a normal person and bury them in a grave, like like he did to the monk? Yes, they could definitely do that. But yeah, like, I like, think well, the let's put them in our punished. walls. It's like okay, that's dumb. Thou shalt right, well, not whatever. have so, sex like, they, while in they bury them room. in the walls, like the whole. No, body. so they ended up executing the monk and burying him. However, the nun who was thought to have the affair with the monk, they ended up bricking her up alive in the walls of the covenant. So she was okay. screaming, scratching, and eventually just died of starvation. So you're, you're just asking for paranormal shit to happen, basically. I think so. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's a good way to start it off. <laughs> so the so we mentioned that the house was constructed in 1862, and in 1863 is when a lot of the hauntings or apparitions and paranormal activity began. So in 1863, locals kept hearing footsteps throughout the house, even when no one was present in the house. So this was before it was even occupied by anyone. Before anyone moved in there, locals, like they would walk by the house and they would hear footsteps in the house walking around. They would hear 
clattering and stuff like that. So this started freaking people out and people didn't want to be around there. Um, this persisted for many years. And as I mentioned, people were scared. They didn't want to be there. We had some incidents occur. So we had uh, four daughters of Rector Henry Dawson Ellis Bull. That's a crazy ass name, hey? Yeah. They saw none. Good name. At the twilight of day, 40 yards away, this is about roughly 30 meters, 37 meters away from them, they attempted communicating with this nun, and the ghost disappeared when they approached it. So four daughters see a fucking crazy-ass nun. They try to communicate with it. It's not saying anything back. It's just looking at them. They start walking towards it, and it disappears in front of them. Hmm. So shit's getting weird. Hmm. Locals later stated that the family residing at the parish was convinced they had seen ghosts on several occasions. So now word's spreading throughout town, and people are getting more freaked out. Locals claimed to have seen a coach driven by two headless horsemen. This was several. This was on several occurrences over the next four years. Headless so horsemen, eh? Not only is the family within the residing in the house now seeing this, also locals around town are seeing this. Okay. Okay. So, Hen- so the patriarch that Henry Don Donis Ellis Bull ends up dying in 1892, and his son Henry took over. On June 9th, 1927, Harry Bull died, and the building was vacant again. So these hauntings persisted from 1892 to 1927. Nothing had changed. They still kept hearing clatter. They kept hearing footsteps. They saw this nun on several occasions, and they saw headless horsemen keep occurring. Okay, so they're, they're not really, so far they're not being harassed or anything. Like They're just no. seeing stuff. No, but it, it, uh, we're building up to that. <laughs> okay. On June 9th, 1927, Harry Bull died and the building became vacant. So on June 10th, 1928, a year later, Guy Eric Smith moved in with his wife. The Smith wife found a brown paper bag in the cupboard while cleaning out the cupboards to move in her own stuff. She found a brown, brown paper bag and inside was a human skull. A young woman, it was later determined. While cleaning, so where did they find the paper skull so bag? So she found it in the cupboard in the kitchen. She it was found just a skull in it? brown paper bag and it was a skull inside. And, and it, was, it was just showed up? It was just there. She just found it. And, and it was that determined was... that it was a female skull. Okay. And I'm guessing they think that that's related to the headless horse men. I think they believe it's related to the nun. Oh, so they think somehow it's the, nun. the nun who was bricked up alive, the skull put in a bag. They believe was now in a paper bag inside of the kitchen of this house. So one she must them, have been so ugly. One of them, maybe witches. One of the well, because they put a brown paper bag on sleep. her head, and then would have <laughs> sex with her. Scare move too. Right? I don't know. That's right. So after uh, the skull was found Beauty is when events started to intensify and occur more often. So before it was just clattering and stuff that they were hearing. Now they were here. Servant bells could be heard ringing, even though they were disconnected with throughout the house. Lights appearing in windows, unexplained footsteps, and the wife believed to have seen the same horse-drawn carriage with two headless horsemen. Hmm... Okay. The Smiths immediately contacted the Daily Mirror asking to be put in touch with the Society for Psychical Research. On June 9th, or on June 10th, 1929, the newspaper sent a reporter. The paper also brought along Harry Price, an actor who was also a paranormal researcher. Okay. Harry Price arrived on June 12th and knew events like stones, vases, and knives being flung around the room started occurring. Messages appeared on the mirror frames, and when Price left, the new events ceased. Smith's wife later stated that she believed that he was a fake conjurer. Oh, like However, he's, uh, he's just fucking shit up himself? Yes. However, on July 14th, 1929, the Smiths left the Borley house. And now we move to 1930s. In 1930, Lionel... Algernon Foister 
a distant cousin of the Bulls, moved in with wife Mary Ann and their adopted daughter Adeline on October 16, 1930. The Foisters, upon moving in, started hearing noises. They started hearing footsteps. They started hearing bells. So the Foisters contacted Harry Price and told him of the events that were occurring while they were present in the home. Bell ringing, window shattering, stones being flung, bottles being flung, wall writing was occurring now, and the locking of their daughter's room, which had no key locks, no keys to it. So they just couldn't, it was like it was being held shut? Exactly. The wife even reported several of her own instances of hauntings to her husband, like her being thrown from her bed, being attacked by a presence. The husband tried to perform two exorcisms. On the first, he was hit in the shoulder with a flat stone. The psychic researchers investigating determined that Marianne Foister was conducting these both consciously and unconsciously. So that she was responsible for these. And yet somehow oh, so no he, one he blames was able the, to see this. The chick? No, this, this is these are the psychic researchers who went and investigated the events. And they said that this woman was doing this while maybe in her sleep, subconsciously and un- unconsciously. So consciously and unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they think like the girl's doing it. The the wife, but yeah, the wife, yeah, it was later the wife. <laughs> it's actually really funny because this is where we get. So you know how I mentioned that she was thrown from her bed while being attacked by a presence. Yeah, it was later discovered that Marianne confessed that she was having sexual relations with the lodger Frank Peerless, and the hauntings were her attempt to cover up her affair. Yep, <laughs> the- as you do. <laughs> The Foisters well, moved out in 1935 yeah. due to Lionel <laughs> Foister's bad health. So they actually ended up staying married together, and the husband got sick, and they moved out in 1935. That's funny. So none of so that was – it was just her being a fucking bitch. Her being a bitch. And then in 1937, Price – so this is the guy who ended up doing his own research on the house – ends up purchasing or renting out the house for an entire year. He enters the property and has – 30 some students who are all psychical research students end up staying there on weekends and recording any and all activity that occurs and sending it to him first for reference. It was determined that a student by the name of Helen Glanville had conducted a seance and was successful in contacting two spirits, according to Price. One spirit, a nun, Marianne, who had been murdered on the property and whose body was in the cellar or a well, as she had said. And the other was a Sonix Amores, who threatened to set fire to the manor at 9 p.m. March 27, 1938. So a year later, this poltergeist threatened to burn down the house. Okay. February 27, 1939, a new owner, Captain W.H. Gregson, knocked over an oil lamp while moving and unpacking in the house and a fire spread quickly, engrossing the house. So many people and locals attributed this to the apparition that appeared in the seance saying that it was going to burn down the house even though it was a year late. Okay. So that's... So the ghost... Or sorry, the poltergeist didn't start the house on fire. It was just an accident from... Someone bumping into the I'm the, just going to finish lamp. that right now. So inv- an investigation later showed the fire was deliberate. <laughs> During the fire, a neighbor reported a nun in the window upstairs. Price later did a dig in the cellar of the remains of the house. So it was actually the, the captain who moved in. He actually, it turns out he set the fire himself because he believed that there was so much paranormal activity happening here that he thought he needed to cleanse the spirits. And he burnt down the house on purpose. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay. So the, it had nothing to do with the poltergeist. No, but Price came back in and did a dig in the cellar because of the seance before saying that a nun's remains were in the cellar or in a well. He did a dig in the cellar of the remains of the house and he found two bones believed to be of a woman. A Christian burial was attempted, but the church refused to bury the bones they believe the, blo- the bones belong to a pig carcass. And what, you can't bury a pig? Apparently not. 
<laughs> after <laughs> thou shall not bury pigs. But they buried the pig and then blamed said it was uh bones to someone else. Yeah. Th- that that's a thought anyways. Th- like okay. the price guy believes it was the female bones and others believe that the church believed that it was the bones of the bones of a pig. So well, the church the church is always credible, so hey. In nineteen forty eight, <laughs> Price dies. And after he dies, Charles Sutton claims to have been hit in the head with a stone while investigating the house. This is a reporter sent out by BBC. On this occasion, he ended up accusing Mr. Price of hitting him in the head. Price denied it, and the reporter and him got into a scuffle, at which point the reporter discovered several flat stones within Price's pocket. So he believed that was Price flinging the stones around to make it look like paranormal activity. So what the fuck are we talking? What's going on here? This is the fakest poltergeist I've ever heard. Yeah, we're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has an explanation. <laughs> Everything has an explanation. Eric Dinwall and K.M. Goldley and Trevor H. Hall wrote a book in 1956 titled The Hauntings of Borley Rectory. And they said that Price had faked some of the paranormal occurrences, but not all. These were well, paranormal researchers as well. Come Throughout on. the late 90s, many accused Price of fraud, and some researchers, Paul Tabori and Peter Underwood, most notably defended Price, saying nothing was faked, that everything was legitimate, and these were evil evil spirits trying to do harm upon others. Now, you guys remember Marianne Foister, the chick who cheated on her husband? Yeah, she's <laughs> that's so fucking Marianne dumb. Foister, later in her life, stated she witnessed no ghosts and no noises were that were no noises in the house. She said that any noises that did occur were winds passing through the old Gothic house, <laughs> which had a her. very unique structure to it, causing weird noises to be heard. Many researchers said the natural wind was responsible for off. weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is what's happening. Many researchers like... said natural wind was responsible for the weird noises due to the odd shape of the house. No, and the walking is... and scratching was that of rats. What a fucking thing to say. She's just getting thrown around and like screaming and shit. She's like, oh, it's just weird wind and a poltergeist is just throwing me around. Like, she was what getting thrown fucking... around and fucked and she blamed it on a ghost. Yeah. What a, <laughs> what a, ra- what a weak I mean, cop out. If you go to England, I this is still ghost. one of the most haunted places in England Was is the remains of this house. Like People still believe that it was actually hauntings rather than all stuff that was factually explained people still believe this is the most haunted house in england in england it still stands to this day it's like on south park when randy gets caught like jerking off and he has like fucking come all over the walls and shit and they're like looking at him all like disturbed and shit and he's like what it was it was a ghost it was a scary ghost it was a ghost and it's like- <laughs> now do you know what's interesting Ectoplasm. about the borley rectory one of the uh one of the priests here who ended up doing one of the exorcisms on the house who attempted an exorcism is also the same priest in one of your stories there, Magnum. One of your oh, topics. Really? Okay, well, we'll see if he pops up. How do you know what his topics are? Because I started yeah, researching you know it, and it actually tied into that topic. So I kind of read about it. And yeah, it's tied us into your topic. It was the same person throughout that time there who ended up performing the exorcism here in had more insight onto your topic. Okay. I mean, to be honest, your poltergeist seems like it's not a poltergeist at all. <laughs> it's like everything had an explanation. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, it this person just admitted. This person just admitted it. Oh, yeah, this person said they started the fire. And the oh, yeah, this person. That, the like, thing that interested me was it, it li- people literally believe this is the most haunted house in England. I'm like, why? So when I looked into it, everything had an explanation. I was like, but people still believe it's hauntings and that it was actually ghosts even though there's a feasible explanation to everything so that's why i had on there and if you were to follow like the poltergeist plan there was shit being flung around it was malevolent it yeah. ended up supposedly burning down the house even though it was a person who, who tried to cleanse the house so yeah well there you go poltergeists just fucking they'll fuck you it's mostly <laughs> mostly people trying to get out of uh, <laughs> being caught in an affair <laughs> it's Huh. Interesting. Okay, cool, cool. What was that one called? That was the 
Brole Rectory. Okay, cool. So I have a, uh, I have one closer to home. I have a Canadian one I'm going to do. It's called The Great Amherst Mystery. And this takes place in Amherst, Nova Scotia from 1878 to 1879. So it's back in the day. It's an older case study. But there actually was quite a bit of info on it. So I'm just right now, like mention something quick if you don't mind. So one of the priests who ended up performing the exorcism in England actually ended up tra- traveling to Nova Scotia and was there with the researchers who had who were interviewing the woman who was there in Nova Scotia. Oh shit. Okay. That's good. That's interesting. So you have I mean, probably how many banger. paranormal how many paranormal investigators are there? I mean, there's probably not a lot, so they probably travel around yeah. and do their shit. This this priest was thought to be an expert because he attempted the exorcism in England. Huh. He was also fucking the wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just you just have all these priests going around fucking everyone's wife. And this is poltergeist. I'm an expert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in getting you on in us. <laughs> fucking so okay, in Amherst is of- yeah, Amherst is a small place. Like even present day, there's about nine thousand five hundred people only. So it's a small place. Um, this was all documented by Walter Hubble. He wrote up this haunting in a book, and like I had mentioned before, this is obviously a conflict of interest. But there are other references that, if you cross-reference them, so other sources do give it merit. So it's not completely. You can't completely write it off. So that's interesting. But, okay, so these visitations, they occur at this house, and the house is owned by Daniel and Olive Teed, and they have two sons, George and Willie, but also Olive, she has... (laughs) 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 Olive also has two younger sisters that live in the house as well. And these ones are somewhat important. So Jenny, she's 22. Esther, Esther Cox, she's 18. So that would mean, holy shit. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say, is that guy's name Willie Cox? Because that would be funny, but it's not. His name's Willie Teed. It's Esther Cox. So she's 18. And also Olive, so this is the wife. She also has a brother living there named William. So it's a fucking full house. They got a lot of shit going on, a lot of people living in this home. Um, Daniel's brother also lives there, and his name's John. So brother John. Johnson? He's... No, his name would be John <laughs> Teed. But <laughs> John, is it Johnson Teed? No, what, his name's which... John. Johnson, There's no son. Willie, <laughs> Fox. There's a lot of dick references in the, in the family. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Allegedly, Jenny was the hot one of the two sisters living there. Esther. And Jenny's the 22-year-old? Jenny's 22. And Esther's 18. Esther's 18, but Esther was considered plump and plain. So she's Whereas, fat. So she's fat. <laughs> so she's... <laughs> and Jenny... So you Jenny, a hot daughter and a fat daughter. Wait, I thought plump that and plain. Uh, back then, plump... Uh, girls were more attractive though wasn't that a thing or was no. that further oh. back that's anyone at least in this story no no one no one said esther was attractive even just so actress esther, esther is fat and ugly and she's plump and plain plump and plain so, so she's like, not special. So like cute, right? Like <laughs> so she's, type of thing. So she might as well just commit suicide and end her life because she's fat. <laughs> she sucks. That's like what are you trying to say? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the freak occurrences started occurring around Esther. Oh wow, interesting. Huh. Well, spoiler alert. Okay, so August. <laughs> That's just an assumption. So August. <laughs> she's very plain. <laughs> yeah. August 1878, There's this is the beginning. This is the beginning of what's going on. So Daniel Teed, his milk cows stopped producing milk. So he suspected that 
someone must be milking his cow and drinking up all the milk. And that's Fucking why it's not produ- <laughs> when you're saying when and you that's say why it's cow, not producing you, milk anymore. When you say cow, you don't mean Esther. <laughs> no, I <mean>, so don't. <laughs> want to make just want to clarify. No, no. So, so it's not making milk. So he's like, someone's stealing my milk. So obviously, he blames Esther. <laughs> he's, what? Yeah, he actually blamed her. Yeah, he blames Esther, number one. He's like, I know you like to fucking drink milk, so it's probably you, you fucking pump, plump and plain motherfucker. <laughs> so she, he blames Esther immediately. Um, but not only just her, he also blamed her boyfriend at the time. Yes, yeah, she had a boyfriend. Um, and honestly, it's funny because the re- researcher that researched this comments on that. He's like, yeah, surprisingly, Jenny didn't have a boyfriend, but Esther did. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's in the that's documented the boyfriend is just a poltergeist <laughs> well this is what happens so the boyfriend ends up leaving after esther and and uh him are kind of accused of taking the milk and the relationship ends so that's kind of like the traumatic event that's cited is this relationship ending so the visitations they start seven days after this so september 4th 5th and 6th there's a series of events and this is 1878 so Esther wakes up screaming in her bed. She thinks it's a mouse or something. She's like, oh, there's a mouse in my bed. Uh. And there wasn't a mouse. So Jenny and Esther, they also hear the next day, they hear a mouse scurrying across the floor. And they're like, okay, let's go find it. And they see a cardboard box like moving as if the mouse ran and hid in the box. When they opened the box, uh, there was no mouse either. So these were kind of like some beginning little sound things and like touching things that were going on. The next day, so this is September 6th, Esther is screaming in her room. Jenny runs into the bedroom and she sees that Esther's face is bright red and her hair is like standing on end. So her hair is like like frizzy and shit because she's fucking plain and doesn't take care of herself. (laughs) (laughs) And her body just starts beginning to swell. And, you know, she's like kind of ballooning up. And, More so I mean, than the plump body she already has. Yeah, well, I was just thinking, like, maybe she has, like, a lactose allergy or something. She's just been drinking all the milk, so she's, like, swollen up. <laughs> I don't know. But <laughs> but that's what happens. So she's turning red, she's swelling up, and she looks like shit. But <laughs> it's, <laughs> but that, it's, it's, it's not anything, anything but has, different. But she has a boyfriend, so it's all good. No, he left. Not anymore. <laughs> Oh, he's gone not anymore. <laughs> so daniel and william so that's the father and his uh i don't know who the fuck william is is william his brother or, no R- william's his wife's brother they run in and there's a huge bang that's heard like it sounds like a cannon exploded outside or something and then esther just falls asleep immediately and returns back to normal so like all that like her face stopped being red her hair stopped being standing out and shit and she wasn't swollen so that's kind of really weird to Mm -hmm. everybody everybody's like well what the fuck just happened so two days later esther is ill and she starts turning red again and jenny and the other men in the house run into the bedroom and the bedding this time is flying off the the bed and like you know being moved across the room and like it just falls and makes a pile kind of thing so that's similar to some of the other shit we were talking about um, they like like messing up your bed. They don't like you having a made bed or anything like that. They <laughs> those motherfuckers. <laughs> so then a pillow hovers in midair and it hits uh, brother John in the head. Johnson. And when that <laughs> Johnson. Johnson, when that happens, the this this cannon sound, that explosion sound happens again, and then Esther just returns to normal and falls asleep immediately. Brother John is freaking the fuck out because he just got hit with this hovering pillow. He leaves. So he just leaves the family and he does his own (laughs) shit. He's gone now. Fuck you guys. I'm out. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, screw you guys. I'm going away from this home. And he left. (laughs) And I'm taking Jenny with me. (laughs) (laughs) Not Esther, though. Leave her out of it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Leave her. Okay, so this is the next thing that happens. I'm going to call it the doctor incident. So Daniel, this is the father, he calls in Dr. Carritt, 
And they're like, because Esther was ill and, you know, she's been ballooning up and shit. So they call in Dr. Kirit <laughs> so- <laughs> to get her on a strict diet, get her some nutritional information. But no, no, just to like call it because she's sick and, you know, this stuff's happening. The doctor does a checkout and he's, he says nothing's wrong. So, but, you know, it's fucking 1800. So, like, what do they really know at that time? But what happens is after this inspection, pillows start flying off the bed and then there's scratching sounds they start hearing on the ceiling and the walls. And then when they hear these scratches, uh, they start seeing claw marks start appearing on the walls and shit. And they actually start writing out something. And it says, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. So that writing comes out on the wall. And that's fucking nuts. Like, I don't know. That, that's that's some scary shit. I don't know. That's, that's creepy. Yeah, that's weird. <clears throat> How does the father have a different last name from the daughters? I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe they just didn't want her to take the last name because it's esther and they're like yeah <laughs> she's playing <laughs> no i actually don't know that's a good point i don't have enough information to answer that but so after this writing two hours later they this is when they start hearing knocks and bangs and this is like a consistent thing for the remainder of this poltergeist um which we'll see so the next thing that happens there's like i said this continued knocking so this this is happening all the time over a three-week period so they actually attempt to communicate with the poltergeist at this point. Um, they and, and, and some other interesting stuff comes up. So like I had said, Esther's boyfriend left, right? Because they were accused of drinking the yeah. milk. Turns out there's more to the story. So her boyfriend, while they were uh, traveling out into the countryside, um, Esther refused to have sex with him. So he he pulls out a gun and he like tries to rape her. But before anything could go further, a farm cart appeared and he sees so someone's, you know, seeing them at this point. So he runs away and flees. So it just happened to be a coincidence that he left because of the, at the same time he was accused of the milk. He actually left because of the um, trying to rape her. Hmm. So it's a little bit more traumatic than initially thought. So she describes her story to everyone because they're hearing all these bangs and stuff. So they're talking about it. And she's like, well, maybe, you know, this has something to do with it. Uh, The ghost bangs back as if acknowledging that was the issue. So like the the poltergeist is acknowledging that's why it's there because of that. The rape. She didn't get raped. The attempted rape. The The attempted rape. Attempted rape. Okay. So Dr. Carmit or Carmite then tries to communicate with the spirit. You know, he's like, if I do one bang, that means no. If I do two, that means I don't know. Three, yes. But they couldn't make it work. So they tried to communicate, but it failed. And the knocking just continues. It continues for more weeks after this. And to the point where it's so loud that crowds start gathering around the house. So like you have crowds coming and they're like, oh, let's listen to the fucking poltergeist make sound and shit. (laughs) So... What happens next, I'll call it the burning incident. So F- Esther leaves because she's sick, and she leaves to stay with some relatives. And at that point when she left, the visitation stopped. So that kind of goes to what we were talking about in the basics when, like, it's associated with a person yeah. more than it is, like, a place or something. A pers- well, it, it can attach to a person, place, thing. Yeah. yeah. So when Esther, she comes back from the relative's place, and everything starts again. So she starts hearing voices that are announcing the house will be set on fire. So what happens is there's a match that gets lit and it starts flying through the air, lands on her bed. And, you know, like it's like the poltergeist is trying to light the bed on fire because the bed's made and he doesn't like fucking made beds. (laughs) So Jenny manages to put it out and the fire never started. But then after that, random matches just start materializing in the bedroom and uh the the knocking like they start materializing and being lit but they're putting them out and the 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 knocking continues and stuff like this but over the next several weeks just like small fires start breaking out in the house it's like you always have to be like ready to go and like put out a small fire because it seems like the poltergeist is trying to light shit on fire now so the the town and neighbors 
they're they're hearing about this small fires breaking out and they're scared their homes are going to be lit on fire and they're like fuck this shit like i don't want my home lit on fire and they're like they're demanding to get esther out of the city like they're like excommunicating her they're like fuck this bitch um we don't want our houses lit on fire get this plain bitch out of here Just because yeah get this plain like, pump okay. yeah <laughs> yeah she's she's bringing down the real estate value of our homes she's <laughs> So She's just going about her business. <laughs> so a, a local restaurant owner takes pity on Esther and he decides to give her a living job instead of her being kicked out. So he's like, no, you can come live at the restaurant and work for us. You don't have to leave. It's fine. Um, it's probably fucking her, but that's a different story. I don't, I don't know. I can't confirm or deny that. So like we said, it's following her. When she's trying to scrub the floors and shit, the brush scrubbers just float in the air. Um, the oven door is flying open by itself. And also, Esther starts, beha- like, random objects, like metal objects, start being attracted to Esther. So, like, knives start flying at her and, like, she's other magnet metal. now. So she becomes magnetized or she just maybe got so massive she had her own gravity well. That's another possibility. Her own pull. <laughs> she- She's been drinking so much milk that she has her own gravity system now. <laughs> also, her parents hated her naming her Esther. Like she had, she didn't even have a chance. She didn't have a last name. They gave her a random last name. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're gonna be Cox, and the rest so, of us are Wells, Tweet, whatever their last Teed. <laughs> so she gets cut by, she gets cut by one of the knives, and I have. Uh, all I could find on that, she did get cut and it, it led her to bleed profusely. So she got fucked up by a knife working at this restaurant. Um, random wooden furniture starts to move around the restaurant, like weird shit like that. Uh, she also... <laughs> so all this is happening. So the, the restaurant owner just fires her. He's like, fuck this. Like, you're fired. <laughs> get out of here. And fair enough, right? Like... You know, you need to run a business. You can't just have fucking knives flying around and yeah, shit. You can't, you can't make everyone happy. I mean, and she's drinking all the milk. They never had milk. All the milk. Yeah, they didn't mention that the How's milk it? still kept disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, I didn't. I don't, I don't know if she was drinking milk or not. But I'll give probably. you one glass of milk per hour. That is your. That is your compensation. <laughs> okay, so. It's now June 1879, and this is where uh, Walter uh, Hubel, the guy that wrote the book on all of this, enters the picture, and he's coming in to document stuff. So as soon as he gets into the house, uh, there's an umbrella that flies through the air and like lands in front of him. So it's like almost like the poltergeist is like, okay, there's a new person here. Fuck you. I don't want you here. I'm here. So he stays there for a bit, and... In his time there, like chairs and tables are moving frantically when he announces that he's staying, almost like the the poltergeist is like, no, fuck you, get the fuck out of here, I'm mad you're here. Esther even says that she heard voices telling her uh, Hubel was unwelcome. So in the time he was there, 45 small fires break out. Esther's stabbed <laughs> 30 different times by pins. And random objects are flying around more than they ever were before. This broad so, just can't catch a break. Like no, got to well, what he's, a little that, bit. <laughs> so oh, envy's getting comfortable. Strike dude, a, it, my back hurts so bad from sitting on this fucking bed. Strike a pose, my chair. Buddy. Oh yeah, definitely. So. <laughs> Hubel, he actually recommends that they should turn it, the poltergeist, into a business. As you do. You know, like, any chance you get, just try and make money. Fuck it. Why not? Fuck it. Gotta but it fails. Gotta pay for all the milk lot he lost, so I mean. <laughs> so it fails. They couldn't make it into a business, and because it, it just wouldn't happen. Like, you know, when she goes on, like, a stage or, like, out in public, it just doesn't happen. It only happens at certain times, and they can't predict when. So it fails. And actually, after that, um, the events start winding down. So maybe the poltergeist was a Marxist 
and was like, oh, they're trying to be capitalistic and capitalize on this. Fuck that. And they, you know, it stopped. It just starts winding down and it's like, fuck it. Or maybe plain old Esther couldn't handle all the attention. Or maybe it, maybe the poltergeist <laughs> stuff was happening, just no one cared to come because they just were like, fuck, I don't want to see Esther. Yeah. Like, <laughs> maybe she's better it, looking. Is Jeannie going to be there? Yeah, is Jenny there? Jenny? <laughs> no? Okay, fuck it. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? Like, that's actually so true. Like, <laughs> like how, like, pretty or, like, attractive people just have more pull, like, in anything. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's definitely. So- there's studies done on this, yeah. Like, fuck off, cat. Um, yeah, like, so if it was her sister, the the pretty one, and she said this ghost or whatever, people would be like, oh my goodness. But because it's Esther, they'd be like, Esther, like, are you putting booze in that milk? Like, you got some, <laughs> <laughs> you mixing that milk with some fireball whiskey? Like, what's going on here? Like, the, you know, you get questioned, right? Like, you have to yep. be a little more. You have to back it up, if you will, right? Like, if you're not, like, the... You need typical... hard evidence. They won't take you yeah. at your word unless yeah. you're hot. <laughs> it's just funny how that works. And that's why <laughs> it's... I don't know. That's why, like, I have hard issues believing so much stuff. Like, when you hear people talk about this type of stuff, you're like... And especially if they're, like, attractive. You're like... How much... You believe them. Like... <laughs> no, I don't. Because I'm like, how much... Because I'm, re- I'm a realistic person. Like, how much is this... A, is it... Are you looking for attention, right? Okay. But wouldn't the plain person be looking for more attention? The plain old Esther? So. I don't think so. So I, I think people I think beautiful people seek out attention way more often than just plain people. Personally. That could be yeah, uh, I could see that. Could no be, fa- could no, be. no facts. No facts to back it up, just my opinion. <laughs> well, no, there actually is. There's studies. Well, that's because they... you're a beautiful person, there, Dragon. <laughs> well, you know we're what? supposed so... to take you at your word. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I say this is like I got two siblings, and both my siblings grew when we were growing up. They're very beautiful. Like my brother was an attractive man, and my sister is a beautiful girl, and I was the, the chubby kid. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, man. Like. They would talk to people, and everyone would just believe what they said. And I'm like, <laughs> would just believe. What they said. <laughs> Honestly, like they would say things, and I, I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but they would just say things, and I sit there and go, like, that's a down. That's not true at all. And <laughs> I, I, I think it's I'm a, I think I'm a pretty reasonable guy, and I grew up with like you guys who are all reasonable people, and we like we weren't like Magnum was this short guy and i was this chubby like we weren't like the beautiful yes you, you know yeah. what i'm trying to say yeah i hear you but like i don't know like there's like kids that we went to school with they would say things and you're like what but like they just got garnered all this attention and you're like okay so it's just not surprising mm-hmm. that rumors spread or stuff like this happens right especially if someone's beautiful i, I don't know like i just just my opinion, I guess. But then Esther defies all logic. But she doesn't seem to be getting. <laughs> she doesn't seem to be getting the the pull that she. Well, besides the gravitational pull, I guess. But <laughs> not, yeah. um, the pull that she needs. She's just everyone's just like, come on, Esther, stop drinking the milk, lay off the sauce. Yeah. Okay. Well, how the story ends. Uh, so things start winding down because th- there's just less stuff happening, and it kind of the poltergeist ends for a bit esther starts working on a farm and then the barn burns down and she's blamed for arson and thrown in prison (laughs) what (laughs) what i should (laughs) (laughs) like what it's a random barn burns down Ah, it's it's esther plain old esther so she does get out of prison and she lived a normal life after and that's it. That's the story of um, that's the great Amherst mystery in a nutshell. You know what's funny? So in both your story and my story, after ship burned down, it ended. The poltergeist activity ended. Ooh, no, well, it took, yeah, I guess, yeah. Or she did just burn the farm barn down, and like she actually did. You know, it mm-hmm. ended 
and then she burnt down the barn and it wasn't related to the poltergeist. It was just her being pissed off. Can you blame her? She's just living in the <laughs> barn with the cattle and shit. She's like, I fucking hate my life. <laughs> burns it down. Amongst her people. Stay with the cows. You're a cow, Esther. You live with the cows. What a terrible name, Esther. (laughs) That's so funny. funny. He just gets like mood at and shit all the time. We probably have some sort of listener out there named Esther, and they're just like, you fuckers. Well, it wouldn't (laughs) be the first time we piss someone off, so. (laughs) Sorry, Esther. Our our, uh, listener sends us a picture of them. It's just a plain old white bitch. (laughs) (laughs) She's just like... She sends us a picture. It's like, her name's Esther. She's just like this mega babe. Like, Whoa, okay. <laughs> well, then, hello. Take I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> what did you have to say? <laughs> All right, yeah, that's my topic. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Poltergeist number two is um, Jeff, the talking mongoose. My name is Jeff. I think it's, <laughs> Jeff. I think it's <laughs> yeah, they spell it with a G, but the pronunciation is just normal Jeff. I'm pretty sure. So okay, yeah, Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, it is pronounced with a or spelt with a G, but I think it's just pronounced Jeff. But anyways, this is so this is the talking mongoose or the Dalby spook. I don't know what that means, but that's the other name for it. So this was the name given to an allegedly talking mongoose, which was claimed to inhabit a farmhouse owned by the Irving family. The Irving's farm was located what in... What kind of fucking DMT are these fuckers on? Like... They obviously were not sure. A talking mongoose? Well, hey, I... Oh, okay, so the Irving's farm was located at Gashin's... Cashin's? Gap near the hamlet of Dalby. So that's probably where the Dalby spook name came from, which is on the Isle of Man, which is in the United Kingdom somewhere. So uh, the story was given extensive coverage by the tabloid press in Britain in the early 1930s. The Irving's claims gained the attention of, I'm going to butcher this word, para, parapsychologists? Parapsych- parapsychologists, yeah. yeah. So, for those who you don't... need more shots, Dragon. More shots. Dude, that's a tough word right <laughs> off the get-go, without the shots. Um, but yes, you are right. Um, <laughs> yes! <laughs> that's number 11. Okay, so... <laughs> that's my limit right there. You've reached it. <laughs> oh, dude. You will never keep up with me. Um, <laughs> so, parapsychologist, just kind of a brief, is the study of alleged psychic phenomena and other paranormal claims. For example, related to near-death experience, synchronicity, apparitional experiences, etc. Does that make sense? To kind of a brief description? Yep. You guys knew this? I didn't know this, so... Yeah, um, it's, come up, it's come up a couple times. All right, fair enough. That would make sense for our podcast. So anyway, so it gained attention of uh, para, parapsych... I'm going to put... Parapsychologists? Paris, thank you. And ghost hunters... Such as Harry Price. Such oh, as Harry- there he is again. This fucking guy's fucking all uh, the wives. Jesus. Man, he's just Jesus. a dirty little whore. Uh, so, such as Harry Price and Hereward Carrington and Nandor Fedor. Hmm. Don't know who. Uh, yeah. Did he so, wear fedoras a lot? His picture has no fedora, but he looks like a fedora wearing guy. Okay. Okay, so the story behind this. So in September 1931, the Irving family, consisting of James, Margaret, and a 13 year old daughter named Boy- Boyery, uh, claimed they heard persistent scratching, wrestling, and vocal noises behind their farm ho- farmhouse's wooden wall panels that ver- so this, these, this resembled a ferret, a dog, or a baby. That's quite f- a lot of possibilities. Related. Yeah, that's kind of vague. So you know, it kind of the- yeah, it's like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Again, maybe the <laughs> let's just cover here. every species on Earth, and maybe it's one of them. Well, you know, yeah, it's I don't know. You gotta do what you gotta do. So, according to the Irvings, a creature named 
Jeff introduced itself and told them it was a mongoose born in New Delhi, India in 1852. According to the daughter uh, Voiri, Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a large bushy tail. So, you know, a baby. <laughs> mm. Really covered the bases there. <laughs> was uh was India a colony of Britain at this time? Oh, good question. Well, this happened in the 1930s and it's so I'm it assuming born... they're speaking English or the mongoose spoke English, so. When did uh I'm going to yes. say it was a colony. When did India leave the colony? Well, whether I don't, know. I don't know when, but it would still be influenced by that. Like, you know, for instance, there's a lot of uh, what what would you say, like communities in India that they do English. have their English speaking and they do actually have a British accent. Like, well, I have when, a friend that's from India and he has a British fucking accent. It's weird, and an Indian accent at the same time. It's very strange. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, oh, um, it was up until nineteen. 19- 48 it became independent okay so it so would have been uh, a colony okay yep. so the irvings say that jeff communicated to them that he was an extra clever mongoose an earthbound spirit and a ghost in the form of a mongoose and one said <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on I, <laughs> like fuck me in the dick like come on this is, what, this, is what, this is what the spirit said. I'm a ghost in the form of a mongoose. <laughs> that mongoose will bite your dick off. You gotta be well, careful. Well, speaking of that, they, he continued to say, I am a freak. <laughs> 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 I have hands and I have feet. And if you saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt? A pillar of salt. What the Um, fuck? So the Irvings made various claims about Jeff. He supposedly guarded their house and informed them of the approach of guests or any unfamiliar dogs. Which, dogs are a threat, I guess. (laughs) Maybe to like your livestock or something. Maybe, yeah, I guess they might have been farmers, yeah. Um, They said... That if someone had forgotten to put the fire, put out the fire at night, Jeff would go down and and stop the stove or put out the fire. The it just sounds claimed, like he's very convenient. Well, it it's sounds like a convenient like, poltergeist. It sounded like for, so. Yeah, they definitely did like embrace Jeff by the sounds of it. So the Irvings claimed that Jeff would also wake people up when they overslept or whatever uh, mice, whatever mice got sex into with the wife. Yeah, he'd also <laughs> fuck the wife and give a quick handy on occasion well, you know what i have what? hands and i have feet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i am a freak <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, he also like would assume a role of the cat so he would he would do all the mousing and stuff like that <laughs> oh come on i fuck this shit he was just a he was just a fucking good old mongoose. Don't you know? judge that poltergeist, Magnum. <laughs> well, why does every poltergeist have to be like a scary, terrible creature? You know, because what that's mean? what it fucking supposed to be. Well, this is well. like okay. Let's continue. This is this is an interesting one. <laughs> uh, so he preferred to scare the mice rather than kill them, because you know he's a nice guy. Um, <laughs> The Irvings say they gave Jeff biscuits, chocolates, and bananas, and food was left for him in a saucer. I bet suspended. they gave him bananas. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Um, so they give him food in a saucer suspended from the ceiling, which he took when he thought no one was watching. Uh, the Irvings claimed what? the mongoose regularly accompanied them on trips to the market, but always stayed on the other side of hedges, chatting incessantly. Um, so the story became popular in the tabloid press and many journalists flocked to the aisle to try and catch glimpses of the creature. Several other people, both locals and visitors, claimed to have heard Jeff's voice and to, to claim to have seen it. However, physical evidence was lacking. Footprints, stains on the wall, hair samples claimed to be evidence of Jeff were identified as belonging to the Irving Sheepdog. So it, it did seem like they mm. were they were um, 
pumping it up. You know what I mean? Like they were. It does really seem like that. They're like they got in the yeah. newspaper and they're like, oh yeah, no, we have a ghost that's named Jeff and it's a mongoose yeah. and it they just cleans our they, house. They made their kid just do Sucks all the mousing. <laughs> <laughs> their daughters doing all the mousing in the house, <laughs> like the Ooh. plain one, the plain one, the plain one. Yeah, uh, what's her name? Esther coming. <laughs> She came to the aisle, the aisle of wherever this is, Isle of Man. Sorry. Uh, okay, so Margaret and Voiry Irving left the home in 1945 after the death of the husband James. They reportedly had to sell the farm at a loss because it had the reputation of being haunted, which is still true in like real world, like today. Like if the house is haunted, it's really hard to sell. Like you have to disclose. Them. Yeah. Which is you yeah, this is close. You, you would do. have someone who's like rich and into ghosts buy it. You, you could probably sell it for more than what you, what you're offering. It yeah, for. you're right. Well, no, because a savvy a, a sav a savvy wealthy person would definitely undercut you. Like they wouldn't announce, "Oh, I'm looking for a haunted house." They'd be like, "No, I'll pay your shit reduction price." You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, like, it's haunted. It's worth more. Yeah, and they'd just be like, no, it's worth less. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. then you keep it. Don't sell it to me. And then they just leave, and you'd be like, fuck. Bluff them. But- you don't sell it to him. <laughs> <laughs> but then well, I would buy the house that had a fucking mongoose that did all that stuff. <laughs> did all the chores. Gave you hand jobs every now and then. <laughs> hey, well, you know. Sounds like a good deal. He's got to pay his rent somehow, I guess. Um <laughs> Oh, excuse me. In 1946, Leslie Graham, the actor who bought their farm, excuse me, claimed in the press that he had. Sh- so Leslie is a man. Um, claimed okay. in the press that he had shot and killed Jeff. <laughs> the body displayed by Graham was, ho- however, black and white and much larger than the famous mongoose, and Voiry Irving was certain that it was not Jeff. She died in 2005. In an interview published late in life, she maintained that Jeff was n- was not her creation. Um, Weird. So, yeah. So, yeah, this actor, bought Les- actor Leslie Graham, bought the house, claimed to a <laughs> shot and killed Jeff. So why would you buy the house if, like, this was, like... Because he was probably like, maybe he was a struggling actor, and he's like, "This is my chance," this and he just to just get, get some the headlines. <laughs> or maybe he just wanted to kill something. Yeah, you know, he's just like, and he oh, wanted to cover it up by saying, "Yeah, he he's like Jeff." He's like, "I eliminated the haunting," and oh, by the way, I'm an actor. My wife's missing. And he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> I you do impressions and. <laughs> You know, I don't know. You got to do what you got to do as an actor. You know what? Yeah, it's a tough world. It's a dog eat dog world, or in this case, mongoose actor eat mongoose world. <laughs> um, so there were some psychic psychic investigators. So in July 1935, the editor of the Listener, Richard S. Lambert, known as Rex, I don't know how he got that name, um, and his friend, paranormal investigator. Harry Price, so he's <laughs> coming back to yep. it. So went went to the Isle of Man to investigate the case, produced and produced the book "The Haunting of the Cashins Gap" in nineteen thirty six. Um, they avoided saying they believed the story, but were careful to report it objectively. The book reports how a hair from the alleged mongoose was sent to Julian Huxley, who then sent it to a naturalist F. Martin Duncan, who identified who identified as a dog hair, Price sus- suspected the hair belonged to the Irving sheepdog Mona. So again, well, like everything kind of comes back to the sheepdog. Yeah, my and, whole thing is like it's a ghost, right? Like, how would it have a physical presence? So, like, well, how could number one, how could you shoot and kill it, and number two, how could you get samples from it if well, it doesn't exist guys, physically? Well, you can say like the poltergeist could be something that takes something physical and then it takes it a physical form embody maybe body yeah. something but yeah it could it could come embody back a mongoose yeah so it could come back as something right because a mongoose shouldn't be able to talk or whatever i find that i find <laughs> actually that harry price 
he also wrote wrote the books on the the previous talk that I covered, the Bro- Broly Rectory. And with that, like he actually sold thousands of copies worldwide and got made a killing off of it. So on this mm. guy? On yeah, the and he was also an actor too. Harry Price? Harry Price. Yeah. What's he with all a, these fucking actors actor being into like poltergeist? He's a paranormal and stuff. researcher. Like, don't they have anything oh. better to do? Oh wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so Price asks Reginald Pocock. Pocock? <laughs> what? Pocock? I like saying Pocock. Pocock. <laughs> uh Pocock, well, I'll go with that. Of the natural history he's museum. Got a little bit of a he's got a, that's such a bad name. <laughs> Pocock. Reginald Pocock. Of the Natural History Who did he Museum. Buck? <laughs> they call me Mr. Pocock. <laughs> Mr. Pocock. He works at the museum. <laughs> anyway, so of the Natural History Museum to evaluate paw prints allegedly made by Jeff in plasticine. Can you imagine uh, if there was a priest named Pocock? That's really disturbing in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they like fuck. So they get Pocock to make to evaluate these paw prints that were allegedly made by Jeff in plasticine, together with an impression of his supposed tooth marks. So Pocock could not match them to any known animal, though he conceded that one of them might have been conceivably made by a dog. Again, everything coming back to the old sheep dog. Did he make a print of his Pocock? Not that I can like see. Like a plaster scene a, print? That'd be a really... It's a dirty cock, if you know what I mean. And I thought... Uh, <laughs> really, I thought really Jeff dirty had print. hands and... Human hands and feet. So oh. would it not be human well, hands in the plaster No, scene? it didn't say human. human it just said hands and feet. I have hands and feet. Not necessarily... It didn't say human. I thought it said human. No. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dragon? Human. No, it just says... Made by Jeff in plasticine. No, no, no. Like no, when Jeff you introduced, said. Uh, Jeff, did he say that he had human hands and feet when he was introducing himself? He said, "I'm a freak. I have hands and I have feet." Yeah. And and if you mm-hmm. saw me, you would faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone, or a pillar of salt. Okay. So I no, he does. It would did not specify human. Um, so what a weird thing to say. He did so. Pukok did state that none of the markings had been made by a mongoose. The diary diaries of James Irving, along with reports about the case, are in Harry Price's archives in the Senate House Library, University of at the University of London. Yeah. Um, so there's some the critical reception. Although some psychic investigators thought that Jeff was a poltergeist or a ghost. Skeptics, including residents of the Isle of Man, believe the Irving family had colluded to perpetrate a hoax that was originated by the daughter yeah. Boyery. An Isle of Man examiner reporter wrote that when he caught the girl making noises, her father tried to convince him the sound came from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> he says, no, it was definitely a mongoose uh, over there. Yeah, behind the bushes. It's a mongoose. There. So yeah, they clearly it wasn't like, my daughter. Put, they put saucers <laughs> in the ceiling and like made their daughter climb up and like eat it or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so according to Joe Nickel, researchers have suspected Voiry, Voiry, the daughter, used ventriloquism and other tricks, the effects of which were hyped by family members, reporters in search of a story, and credulous paranormalist i'm probably butchering that word credulous credulous c-r-e-d-u-l-o-u-s credulous yeah credulous paranormalist um okay yeah i thought this one was pretty funny yeah <laughs> no br- that's it's a good really, one it's really brief it's it's i like it's, it it's funny it, it's, it's good. cool to me it's cool to me like 1930 like that's Less than a hundred years ago, ninety years ago, and like that wasn't long ago. And like stories like this would still gain traction. 
just crazy to think. Cool. I like it. All right. All right, Andrew, let's fucking hear it. So my second one is a smaller topic, but it is the Baldoon mystery. This is a Canadian poltergeist story. Nice. Baldoon? Baldoon Baldoon mystery. Okay. So the settlement was started by Lord Selkirk. Uh, It was made to mirror his Scottish homeland. This is a settlement built in southern Ontario. Lord Selkirk imported sheep and convinced 15 families to join him on his trip from Scotland down to or over to Canada, Ontario. Okay. So he arrived on September 5th, 1804 with 15 other families. Amongst the families were the McDonald's. He expressed that they had a rough start. There was lots of swampy land where they settled. It was, it was in Southern Ontario. Sheep were not thriving and the colony was invaded and attacked several times. It was invaded in 1812 by the American troops. Damn Mongolians. These damn Mongolians. Americans. South Park. Americans. <laughs> Stay away from my wall, you goddamn Mongolians. <laughs> okay, so in the beginning, <laughs> so events started to occur around 1829. Some women of the community were prepping hay in a barn for harvest and to pack it up for, for their livestock and animals. The structure began to shake. Poles started falling from the ceiling around the women, and the structure started to collapse. It was the men later investigated, and no sources were found. They believed the structure's integrity had not been messed with, and they believed it was some strange force or freak accident that had occurred in order to cause the barn to collapse. This is the first. So that's the first incident. There's a the this barn the starts shaking. Incident. Yes. There's a lot so of women Ms. in the barn. Miss McDonald, the wife of the of the patriarch of the McDonald family, was in presence of all the other women when this occurred. Sounds like there was a big orgy in that barn. You know yeah, when they I say mean, there could have been if a the lot of van holes, is a rockin', don't come a knockin'. It's the same thing with the barn. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Or come a knockin'. You know, add to the so. The After this incident, just... incident, um, Miss McDonald went home to her family, and later that week, they started to hear sounds and footsteps at all hours of day and night. Whoa, 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 whoa! It's... The owner of the farm is named McDonald. Yes. Oh, McDonald had a had farm. a farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Fuck it. Is and old McDonald had a cool. wife. And on this farm, got he fucked by Harry Price. Poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> and on this farm, he had an orgy yeah. with a poltergeist. Boo boo there, and a ho ho there, <laughs> <laughs> and a mongoose there. Um, yeah, everywhere so a mongoose, sounds... there's a mongoose. <laughs> I don't know how to. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez. Um, right. yeah. So. The McDonald family started to hear footsteps at all hours of the day and night throughout their home. Some sounds sounded like many marching men going off to war. The noises would stop abruptly when the lit candle or oil lamp was brought near the noise, and the noise would disappear for several days on end, and then it would return. Okay, sorry, let me interject. Okay, the barn, Why? who were the women in the barn, and why was there so many of them? Are so they the daughters? Men worked the fields and the women of the of the families, they ended up prepping the hay and prepping the livestock and stuff in the barn. So So when men a, But they live on the, the men, farm. Yeah. They, they all have farms. So this settlement was created by Lord Selkirk and each each of the fifteen families who went with them, they all have a farm on the settlement. Oh, I see. So it is could it not just be possible that it's just the men like sneaking into the, the rooms and then like you know, when you shine, it's like shining a flashlight in an area and it's just people sneaking away and that would explain the footsteps and like the... I mean, it could be. But you know, yeah, a few nights later, the noises to would fuck. start again in the same spots that the light was taken to. And most of the sounds occurred in the kitchen. Yeah, you, that's where people have sex. Moving on. 
a few weeks later, the McDonald's were the the McDonald were up, the McDonald wife and husband were up in the nursery discussing something, and the cradle of which their baby was in started to rock slowly, and kept increasing speed. No one was touching the cradle, but yet it started to vigorously rock and increased violently to the point of tipping over. The baby yeah, was in it. Yeah, the daddy. baby was in it. They oh, said they were very thankful the baby was very young and could not recall these occurrences. Otherwise, this would have been a traumatic experience for the baby. Well, yeah, you don't ever want to, you would never want your child to know that you gave it brain damage. So, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, why is there this dent on my forehead? <laughs> <laughs> so, why noises am I persisted. <laughs> noises persisted. And a couple weeks after the, <laughs> the rocking of the cradle, a fire erupted on the settlement. Okay. When it was put out, as soon as it was put out, immediately another fire occurred several feet away. Was when it the that baby? Fire was, it's just no, like Stewie Griffin from Family Guy. <laughs> when that fire was put out, <laughs> more fires, way. more fires, this time doubling in number, started a blaze on other parts of the settlement, all around the McDonald family house or farm. Sorry. Okay, so yeah, more burning stuff. That seems like a common occurrence with the poltergeist phenomenon. When the fires were finally settled, a week later, rocks and bullets were flung at the house. No, There was no one around, but they were just hovering in the air and start flinging at the house. The McDonald family residents would collect the stones and collect all the bullet casings and bullets, and they would keep them in the house. Later, a few days later, the same occurrence would occur. The stones and the bullets were still inside the house. However, new stones and bullets with the exact same markings as the previous stones and bullets would appear behind the house being flung at the house. And fire started to erupt again. What the fuck's happened on this farm? I don't know. Word spread. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) So travelers would see this and hear of this they would go look at it for themselves and they'd be convinced that this house was haunted so they started spreading word to other people and eventually this reads reached the newspapers and the newspapers went out to interview the mcdonald family fuck every time it hits the newspaper it's a uh, you got a fucking actor coming in trying to take advantage of shit or something like when it seems the newspaper, like the newspapers when i don't know like things get weird yeah no, That's you're like, I mean. like, you're right. Shit, shit gets fucked up. <laughs> it's totally, yeah. It's a scam. It's always a scam. Yeah, but like <laughs> this started in 1829, <laughs> and it persisted for a very long time. So, the newspaper shows up, and the McDonald McDonald family decides that they're going to move away to the father's house. So this is the father of the of the wife. They decide they're going to move to to his house. So they can do their own paranormal research and stuff at the farm. The the events apparently followed the family to the father's house. The family okay. got discouraged and went back to their own house because they, they're like, we'd rather have our own privacy or our own home if these events are not stopping. When they returned to the house, the events started again. They seemed to have followed the family regardless of where they went. The family moved back to their house when the events didn't cease after moving at, at when they didn't cease at, at the father's house, but yet new events started to occur. Events like stones being flung up and down throughout the house, screeching, and in some cases, the children would be scratched and accosted by an unknown presence. Probably Pukak. Could be Pukak. <laughs> the family began began to get get worried and they sought the help of anyone who could offer it there was a woman who lived several towns over who was known for her second sight she had the ability to commune with the dead okay here's a question weren't they like never <sighs> I'm just thinking back to like which witch is being killed and stuff. Like, wouldn't any person claiming they could talk to the dead just be killed as a witch and like burned at the Maybe. stake? But apparently, this one wasn't. 
Or okay. fucking... <laughs> I guess we're in Canada. We're more tolerant of... <laughs> Well, I mean, so, it was the 1820s. I feel like that should happen in Canada, too. Maybe. Well, she was fine. I don't know. She didn't get burned at the stake. Yeah. Did she? So, did they drown her? If you come to the surface, you are a witch. And if well, you drown, what you have to know is that the McDonald family <laughs> moved here in 1829. So the events aren't stopping. And in 1830, they go and see this woman. Uh, the seer ends up doing a reading for the entire family in the presence of the entire family. And she summons a spirit. What kind of spirit? Which she talks to. It was just a spirit. Jeff. Didn't say what it was. The mongoose? Leave Jeff the seer out of said that it was a curse placed upon the property by an old woman in 1820 attributed to an argument the McDonald family had before moving to their new settlement on the land. This old woman apparently had an argument with the McDonald family in which her and her two sons were kicked out of their homes back in Scotland. And the old woman had set a curse upon the family that followed them to this new settlement. Okay. So the seer suggested they do a ritual. We don't know what the ritual was. However, the ritual was performed in 1930. And after the ritual was performed, all events of poltergeist ceased. Okay. The family ended up living out their days on the farm peacefully. And in 1930, the farm burned down under mysterious circumstances. What the fuck is going on? Why is everyone burning shit down at the end? Like every single time. I don't know. Like, burn it. And that burn remains it. one of the most famous Canadian hauntings. <laughs> burn the motherfucker down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Back what is that, uh, Harold and Kumar? Yeah. Remember in, uh, <laughs> remember in grade school, in like grade seven, we did like a presentation and our we had to redo it, but our thing was like, burn the mother truck it down. Burn the oh, mother yeah. truck. <laughs> <laughs> our teacher made us redo the whole presentation. She's like, wait, <laughs> was this the, uh, the bridge? <laughs> What's that? Was no, this when we had to make the bridge out of those? Oh, it was um, like some puppet play or something like that. Oh. Yeah, I don't remember what I dude. I don't. That's funny when you say that. Now I'm kind of vaguely remembering stuff, but I barely. Rem- I do remember that though. The burn the mother yeah. trucker down. So it was so funny. So we had, we did this presentation. I don't know. I can't remember exact details, but I got super hyped that it was going to be so <laughs> amazing and just like so like edgy, if you will. And our teacher, and we had to get we had to like she, caught on to it. She caught on to it. She nixed like half our presentation, but she gave us like an extra week to like redo it. But in our, <laughs> and then everyone was thinking that our presentation was going to be so good, and it was good. But like, it was, it was neutered. Sick. It was neutered because we're going. Yeah, and I don't remember the details of it because this is fucking like twenty years ago, but um, or fifteen years ago. But it was in one of the lines for sure was. Burn the mother trucker down. Yeah. <laughs> that was our loophole. I bet you I could fucker. find, I could probably find that presentation. That'd be funny. So yeah, every time I, every time I hear the burn the motherfucker down, that's what I think of. Burn the mother <laughs> trucker down. <laughs> is your, uh, is your story finished? Yeah. Yeah. That was it. After the house burnt down. House burns down. It. They burn the mother trucker down. They burn the mother trucker down and everything ends. Let's see. Get rid of poltergeist. Burn it down. <laughs> All right, I will conclude then with uh, the Black Monk of Pontefract. So this particular poltergeist... Was he actually black? Oh, we will see. Ooh, we will see. very insensitive view. <laughs> he wasn't actually black. He was just black face at the time. It's Justin <laughs> Trudeau. It was Justin Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> it's Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Every so time. Justin Trudeau is the black monk of Pontefract. <laughs> <laughs> Who apparently has time travel. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so this particular poltergeist, um, apparently a lot of scenes in the film Poltergeist from 1982, which was a big hit at the time, a lot of the scenes from that movie were based on events that occurred in this story. So that's interesting already. And this is a more... Um, 
contemporary account. This happened in 1966. It's still quite old, but it's not as old as like the 1800s that most of the ones we've talked about have been. Um, it takes place in 30 East Drive, and this is in the heart of Pontefract, Yorkshire. It's a family that gets affected, kind of, which will make sense in a second. So Joe Pritchard and his wife, Jean, uh, they have a son named Philip. He's 15, a daughter, Diane, who's 12. They, they experience some shit, or, <laughs> or rather Philip initially, which will make sense when I explain this. But the house, allegedly, it was built on land that was used for executions. So there used to be a stream that flowed through the area and there used to be a footbridge that people used to cross the stream and the the footbridge was called Priest's Bridge. Like, so the stream's not there anymore and the the bridge isn't there anymore, but it's kind of important for the rest of the story um, because this is all really close to the home. So this is how the visitation begins. The family goes on holidays, but Philip, the son, he stayed back at home. He didn't go with them. And he stayed home with uh, Jean's mother, who we'll call Mrs. Scholes for the rest of the, the story. So that's his grandmother. He's at home with his grandmother. So it's 11.30 a.m. on a Thursday, and it's kind of like a hot day. Um, I think... Philip was out in the garden and Mrs. Scholes was doing whatever the fuck old people do in homes, She's knitting or something. I don't fucking know. Then a gust of wind rattles through the home and it's kind of weird. That's how things start. Then there's like a white dust that appears and it's kind of like, like picture like chalk dust, but it's floating kind of near the ground and it's kind of falling towards the ground but never quite settling on the ground. It's like a constant white dust going down. And both the grandmother and Philip are seeing this and they're, you know, they're freaking out. They're like, what the fuck is this? So they call some family members to come over and check it out. Cause obviously that's fucking weird. And they're like, what the hell is going on? So the family come comes over. And at this point, all the dust kind of settled and there's just this weird dust that came out of nowhere. And it's just, it's just everywhere. The other thing that's fucking weird, pools of water start forming randomly throughout the house. So like they're mopping it up and after they mop up a puddle that forms, another one just forms somewhere else. So like they can't get rid of it. And I think that kind of ties into that, uh, that stream that was near the house or like passing through the house or whatever. It's not there anymore, but maybe that ties into that, why they're seeing this water damage out of nowhere. They actually, they call uh, an engineer from a local water company and they're like, okay, we have like random (laughs) pools of water forming everywhere. Like, can you see what the fuck's going on? He comes, checks shit out, can't find what the issue is. While he's there, they're mopping shit up and stuff just keeps appearing random places. So it's like a weird problem. Yeah, maybe yeah, but he's just making, he's just like, oh, I don't know what the problem is. And he's just like, like he's got like a water bottle squirting water <laughs> everywhere. You better fix that. We're going to need more time and money to address the issue. <laughs> That's possible. It's but theory. <laughs> other things that start happening, there's broken pot plants that start occurring. Lights turning on randomly, cupboards rattling, wardrobes dancing around, shit like this. This is typical stuff that we've seen in the other case studies. Sounds like Beauty and the Beast. Why Beauty and the Beast? Wardrobes dancing. Oh. (laughs) Fucking Disney. Motherfuckers. Um, (laughs) They call the police. They're like, fuck, this is crazy. We need to get some... Let's see what's going on. Maybe there's intruders in here or something. Please come search the home. No intruders. No signs of pranksters or anything like that. They literally find nothing. So they can't explain what's going on. So what do they do? They're like, okay, like we've kind of exhausted our re- our resources here. Let's call a friend. <laughs> so they call this guy named Old Donald, and I guess he's just interested in paranormal shit. And he comes over. When he arrives, it's said that 
he says like the house was cold and like i said it was kind of a hot day it was a hot time so the house is cold when he arrives and he's explaining the difference between ghosts and poltergeists to them because you know he likes paranormal shit and as he's describing this he says poltergeists are often associated with the destruction of photos as he's saying this a wedding photo just gets fucked you know like the picture frame falls over it breaks and the photo inside gets torn in half so it's almost like the poltergeist knew what O'Donnell was talking about and was like okay you think you think you know here we go and did exactly what he said basically so this poltergeist lasted for two years um <laughs> or not lasted for two years but at this point things stopped so really it was just Philip and the grandmother initially that were affected things stopped for two years but now the family's back, obviously, from their holiday. Things start up again. So this is Who two the years fuck later. Goes on a two year holiday. No, that's not what like the hell. That's not what I said. I said so they were gone on holidays. The per- poltergeist stuff happens but stops. And then they come back from holidays, and then two years goes by and nothing is seen again. So okay. it's almost like they probably don't really believe what Philip and the grandmother had to say because they never experienced it themselves. But then it starts up again. So again, pots are being like pot plant planted pots or <laughs> plants in pots are being upturned. There's broken paste pots being thrown around. Paintbrushes are being thrown around and shit. Um, Diane, the daughter, actually gets hit by one of the paint paintbrushes, but she's Is fine. She she's one. Get, <laughs> I don't know if she's playing or not, but she just wears it like she took the hit, and that was documented. Like she got hit. And, you know, they're like, oh, fuck, Diane, are you okay? And she was fine. She just wore it. No problem. But now they're experiencing it all. Like, they're like, oh, shit, like, this is actually happening. They hear a, a tearing sound in Diane's room. And they run up to see what it was. One of the the curtain um, plummets, it's torn off the wall and thrown through an open window into the garden. So the father, Joe, he, like, slams the door shut. And he's trying to be like, okay, let's just trap whatever it is inside. And the door is actually like rattling as if something's like in there trying to get out. But then everything's just silent after that. And <laughs> the family just like goes to bed. They're like, oh, okay, I guess. Well, like, here's my thing with a lot of this. Wouldn't you just fucking leave? Like, yeah. If something that crazy happened, I would just leave. Like, I wouldn't stay in the house. I would just go somewhere else, move well, on. You're supposed to get the press to come if you just leave. I mean... There you go. If you've invested a lot in the house and you like, purchase the house and you just have to sell it, it's going to be hard selling where you're going to live in that time. They're, I'm assuming, like, they're far away from family type things. So. I don't know. It just seems weird to me. So this poltergeist, you know these similar patterns start occurring for the next nine months. And the family just starts referring to the poltergeist as Fred. So it's usually, they, they notice from about supper time to about 1 a.m., that's when the poltergeist is active. So that, you know there's lights being turned on and off, objects moving, a lot of bangs and knocks. Uh, there's one incident where the poltergeist took a bite out of a sandwich so, like, randomly, they just saw the sandwich get a bite taken out of it. Um, but, I mean, who and can another avoid weird... a good sandwich, though? Like, I love <laughs> me a good sandwich. It's there, Fucking taking... Justin Trudeau. I'm mm-hmm. taking a bite. What is that? No, seriously, if there's a sandwich there, because... I'm eating it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, true. Another weird incident that happened, the poltergeist was allegedly... It put on, like, these cool gloves... And was just walking around the house with cool, like like an invisible person wearing gloves. So it's just like showing off gloves. So just floating gloves. Yeah, I thought that was kind of strange. It's like, oh, look at my cool gloves. It's look Michael Jackson. Cool <laughs> it's just Michael Jackson. Um, their daughter Diane, her mattress would float in the air. Allegedly, this is funny. I'm telling you, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Uh, 
Well, except he's more, he's white face. He's not black face. He's, <laughs> he's a little different. How long ago was this? <laughs> the 60s. So a guest in the house was attacked with a milk jug and drenched in milk. Sweet, savory milk. Esther, she comes all over her face. Esther. <laughs> <laughs> um, doorknobs. This was a weird one. Doorknobs would be smeared with jam. What? You know, and just fucking people up, making their Never hands heard of a sticky. Never guy's story where jam was smeared on. Your fucking- it is weird. The poltergeist would also TP the house occasionally. They would just toilet paper the home like a fucking asshole. It also egged the home once. Mm. You know, typical prankster shit. One of the weird scenarios with the eggs, the so the mom, Jean, their house was being egged, and she sat on the box to prevent the eggs from being taken out of the box. But then it still happened. So it was like the poltergeist could physically remove physical objects from a container, which was strange. So the family w- would witness the shit happening in front of them. Yes. Like they, they didn't see anyone. It, it was just like floating shit and then yes. smashing their house. Okay. Exactly. So this is so things start happening at this point. So <clears throat> Diane is attacked by a black shadow at one point, and this is like one of the first uh, getting towards the climax that's about to happen that I'll talk about. They see this black shadow, and she's attacked by it. Now, they weren't sure what the fuck was going on. Like, they didn't know about this execution ground or anything at the time. But allegedly, uh, so they, 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 they start looking into things, and someone lets them know that in the 16th, 16th century, there was an evil monk and this monk raped and strangled a teenage girl and then was tried and found guilty for the crime. So he was led to the gallows, which were outside Pontefract, on this hill, which the house was built on. So he's, you know, he's executed. After, after they learn this information, the Pritchard family starts seeing Fred. So they're actually now instead of it just being a floating thing, wearing gloves and like jamming the doors, <laughs> like the doorknobs and shit, they actually start seeing the poltergeist. Monk. So it's a black figure that glides around and it had a cloak and a hood and a black robe. I don't know why, but it starts imitating the sounds of cows and chickens and breathing heavy. So it just that's how it's fucking with them now. It's making cow and chicken sounds. You know? Uh, it's mooing at uh, Esther. Fucking <laughs> Esther. Moo. Or, moo. You want this tit? You, you, you want this tit? You want this milky fucking bitch? <laughs> <laughs> so they start referring to it as the black monk now. And that's that's kind of where the name comes from. How it climaxes, Diane's attacked by the black monk. And you have to remember the monk. Strangled and raped a teenage girl, alleged, like, back in the day. So she, he's attacking Diane at this point. And Old it's, like, Diane? a big thing. Uh, she was 12. She might Well, actually, she would have been 14 at the time because it was two years okay. later this happened. So she's getting choked by the black monk who could, may or may not have been Justin Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> CBD. And... The Philip, the brother, attacks the figure, and when he attacks this invisible, like, assailant thing, everything just stops. Allegedly, the daughter had red marks on her neck, so that kind of added to the creepiness of everything. But that was the last attack, the last event. Philip sees this black monk in the kitchen, and it just sinks into the floor. And they never saw it again. And that was the end of this. That was the Black mm-hmm. Monk of uh, Pontefract. Kind of crazy. Interesting. Yes. Fuck. No uh, skepticisms on it? Oh, we'll get into final thoughts. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should do... Let's just 
Should we hop into final thoughts here or what? Yeah. I think, Wrap yeah. this motherfucker up. Absolutely. Um, so are we just going to ask about poltergeists in general or what? I yeah, think what it do should we think? be whether, whether or not we believe in poltergeists. Sure. Oh, so we're drawing a hard line in the sand. Um, no. Super I'm, hard. I'm going to say no <laughs> then. Um, what about the mongoose? The mongoose. It was clearly a sheepdog that they just, I don't know, claimed to be a mongoose. No. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. I feel like these stories are tough. They gain traction by... Like they gain traction Hot people by... talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It just gains traction by word of mouth and this fear. And there's never anything backing it. And there's always, there always every story you come across, at least the six stories we talked about today, there's always kind of something that it's like, oh, well, no, they there, like there's always skepticism behind it and i've never been big on the paranormal stuff so and and my thing too is like you see today like there's like what was that like there's like a long island medium show or whatever like people oh people pe- people continue to make money off this paranoia if you will and yeah gypsies I, gypsies yeah i don't know man like it's <laughs> I'm not buying it. No, I don't believe it. This is one that I won't. They're uh, they're not turning the frogs gay, if you will. Um. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I'll go next then. Okay. I uh, I do believe there are spirits, ghosts, and stuff. I don't necessarily believe there are there are uh, malevolent spirits like poltergeists. But just from personal experiences, I do believe in ghosts and like the afterlife or apparitions being able to come back and maybe communicate some through noises but not as far as it burning yeah, a house mushrooms. down or destroying shit or attacking people so hard no uh, no that was a yes for me but oh hard i, I don't believe they're malevolent some, but i believe yes, that there is somewhat yeah okay yeah okay so i think all of it is fucking bullshit, to be honest. However, I believe the mongoose was a real story. Haha, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I brought the correct story to the table. <laughs> I think I think if a poltergeist if it's a mongoose, it happened. If it if it wasn't, then it's just not it's just not a thing. Yeah, there's just not enough, uh, like, my main thing is, like, some of these were present day. So, for instance, the Black Monk of Pontefract, <clears throat> I don't know, if, like, my, if I knew someone who was attacked and strangled and they had red marks on their neck and stuff, like, I would take photos of it and, like, Pictures, document yeah, it yeah, videos. <laughs> yeah. Like, exactly. it seems to me, like, the lack of documentation is a, the main thing that takes away from everything. And there's there's the incentive to gain from the story is greater than not, you know, like you you push it as far as you can, <laughs> you know. It's like exactly, yeah. It's like That's... if someone has a viral video or something, they they try push it as far as they can. You know what I mean? Like they'll they'll try get on Ellen because they had cool shoes or like you know like the white vans. Daniel, like stuff like you know, like you you push it as far as you can. Damn, Daniel, back at it again with the live yeah. fans. Yeah, it's the same thing with the poltergeist. It's like, oh, a poltergeist happened. There's some buzz and some hype. You know, of course you're gonna try sell a book. You know, make a biz, like make something happen. So you milk it. It's like the Baltic Get Sea. Paid. <laughs> it's like Esther. Yeah. It's like Esther. And the cows. So I think that's Plain my final old take. Esther. No, it it always um, comes down to money. Unfortunately, with these stories, it seems like, or some sort of ulterior motive, right? Um, alternative yeah. motive, and, and even if some I of the was, ones. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, even some of the ones we talked about, there seem to be very plausible explanations for everything. So, and people were still saying that it's this haunted thing and it's like not at all. I think me personally, like if I were to experience some sort of poltergeist activity, I would record as much as I could, but I try and profit off of it too. I mean, I'm getting fucked <laughs> with, might as well get paid for it. Well, of course, I'd do the same thing, but that, isn't that just saying that why this is a bit of a scam? Like, well, I mean, I would record as much as I could. I'd, I'd try and keep that there. But And then if you only got minim- minimal uh, info, you would be like, okay, well, I got to stretch it until I make a buck off of this. You See, I, I mean? would like to think that I would be honest about it. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. Like, I, I, I wouldn't make shit up. I'd be like, okay, if it's happening, it's happening. If it's not, then obviously it's not haunted. And the property value of my home isn't going to go down. Yeah, I mean, it seems like we're all in agreement on this one. It's more of a, it didn't really get any of us. No, story, right, these types of stories never, this is not my thing, right? Um, the paranormal stuff is not what I like. It's not what I, I don't think you're going to sell me on it. I don't know. It's always mm. people stretching it, but we'll see. Hey, mm. we'll see. Maybe my opinion can be changed. Cool, cool. All right. Let's uh let's roll out of it. Let's thank Sidestepping the Sun, Canadian rock band, for making the intro and outro music to the podcast. That's super appreciated. Secondly, still unofficial sponsor of the podcast, Al Yucateco Hot Sauce, King of Flavor, good shit. Literally just letting people know if you like spice, you like hot sauce, you're probably gonna like El Yucateco because it's my favorite. And I use it every day. There's no calories. And it's good shit. Put it on craft dinner. Put it in your scrambled eggs. Put it with your steak. It's just, it's just good. It's nice. And if I enjoy we like it, load. you're gonna fucking like it. <laughs> you're gonna fucking it. like it, you fucking bitch. <laughs> Go get your milk. <laughs> you fucking whore. Okay, let's. Oh, aggressive today. Aggressive, right. aggressive sales tactics all right for all of our (laughs) valued listeners if you want to tell us how much you enjoy the sort of podcast and el yucateco hot sauce you can do so several ways but first you should let el yucateco know that you heard about their hot sauce from us reach out to them on twitter facebook instagram so let them know once we get that sponsorship sponsorship we'll say we will share that love with you so you can follow us and contact us. Let us know about the episode, any questions, concerns, comments, and or suggestions for topics. You can do so through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Quora, Reddit, fucking TikTok. We're, we're everywhere. YouTube. Let's, like, reach out. We're fucking listening. We're waiting. So everywhere. if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can do so through Patreon, where we have two exclusive tiers. We have our $1 Ride the Wave tier. This will get you exclusive number of content, and you will get numerous shout outs on the Swerve podcast. Then we have our three dollar tier, which every person thus far has subscribed to. This is our slap that ass tier. With this tier, you will get exclusive, never before heard content. You will get numerous shoutouts on the Swerve podcast, and most importantly, you will get early access to all of our main episodes and our post swerves. You will get this access on Sundays, three days and five days prior to their releases. So you will be the guy to know. You will have the, all the information at your disposal, so you can fucking brag, show off. And just, you know, make people feel bad about how little they know compared to you. So do Fuck that and subscribe to us. And if for some reason you're against Patreon and you would still like to support us financially, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com where we'll take your donations, buy some coffee beans, and we'll fucking grind that shit down into 20, 30, 40 cups of coffee to give you some enthusiastic, caffeinated content. You know, keeps you and keeps us awake. So be on the lookout. On that note, please slap that ass and ride that wave.